Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, can I say thank you to the B-Sides organisers. It's great to finally be at an in-person event um, for B-Sides again. Um, the virtual sessions were great, obviously, and necessary during COVID, um, but it would be a bit disheartening sometimes seeing people kind of lose interest and drop off a call. At least in person, it's way uh, too socially unacceptable for you to just walk out of the room during my talk, but please don't try and test that. I know we might be running into morning tea with my session. Um, so my name is Harriet Farlow, and I'm a PhD candidate at UNSW Canberra. Uh, looking at cybersecurity and specifically machine learning security in the context of adversarial machine learning. I'm also an assistant director at the Department of Defense, but my employer does ask me to clarify that this talk is not in relation to my defense role. So in case they're listening, I've said that now. <laughs> um, my career experience before my current role involved um, defense consulting, um, academia, a tech startup in New York City, um, which was really cool, very different, you know, as a 12-person company to working in the public service as I do now. Um, but the commonality between all of my different jobs is that all of them have been looking at artificial intelligence or machine learning in some way, either from the selling side, the buying side, or the implementation side. And one thing that I've noticed across all of my different jobs is how it's really challenging to do correctly um, everyone was grappling with it in a very different way and for very different reasons. And when we look at the number of industries and increasing number of, of use cases that machine learning and artificial intelligence has these days, um, but also the risks that it can pose and how many of our decisions it's being incorporated into, um, I think it's increasingly important that we do make sure that artificial intelligence is created to be safe, secure and ethical and that there's more awareness raised that it is actually an attack surface, just like cyber security systems are. So that's why I'm talking at B-Sides today. I know that AI security isn't necessarily a typical cyber security topic, but the intersection of machine learning security and cyber security has never been so relevant. And I think all of you as cyber security professionals have a lot to bring machine learning security. So I'm gonna start with a question, what is AI? I think people talk a lot about artificial intelligence and it kind of kills me a little bit because artificial intelligence really is just the business term for machine learning. Um, but it's also, a, it can be a good way of describing what the real you know, use cases for AI might be. Um, but so when I ask this question, I usually get a response something like, like this, <laughs> the Terminator. Um, can I get a show of hands, everyone in the room who has seen the Terminator? Okay, good. So I thought that uh, I wasn't sure if um, it would be mostly students or younger people in the crowd today. And it was only when I finished the presentation, I thought, oh, bummer, maybe no one's actually seen the Terminator. But everyone kind of gets the gist of, of the plot, right? Even if you haven't seen it, and a lot of people have. Um, so the idea is that, you know, in the future, there's this AI called Skynet that's taken over the world. Um, and so it sends the Terminator back in time to kill sort of the only threat that it faced, which was this guy called John Connor, who was kind of rising up against Skynet, um, leading this group of vigilantes. And so Terminator goes back in time to kill Sarah Connor, who is John Connor's mother, um, before John can even be born. Um, so I think this is probably a good time to define exactly what artificial intelligence is then, if this is the kind of idea that most people think about when we think of AI. Um, so I'll start by defining our objective for today. Um, we're going to look at, you know, at, at Skynet. Um, I usually kind of, you know, when, when people say the Terminator AI, I'm like, haha, okay, good joke. And I, I don't know if it's because most of the people I work with are sort of born in the 80s or whether the Terminator really is just a great example of, of AI. Um, but I decided to lean into it. So what if there was a smarter way that we could prevent Skynet or the Terminator from being successful in its mission? Um, what if we can hack Skynet so that it cannot identify and kill Sarah Connor? Entirely possible to do. So that's our objective for today. I'm going to show you how via yeah, a bunch of different adversarial machine learning attacks, we can hack Skynet. Um, so it's a good time to think about the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so artificial intelligence tends to be broadly defined really as a group of technologies that can do something um, 
that otherwise a human might have done. So that's why it tends to be used as a good business term. Um, whereas machine learning is sort of the technology that underpins most artificial intelligence technologies. And machine learning broadly, um, there's lots of different kinds of architectures and different kinds of ways that machine learning can be implemented. But basically, it's a way of building a model architecture, giving it some input data, um, input data, defining what good output looks like or what, what it should um, classify an output as, and then letting it run over many, many iterations, updating the information within this model architecture so that when it sees a new piece of information, it can correctly classify that output. Um, so that's a very broad term. So I guess technically my talk should have been called how to, hick, how to hack a deep neural network, specifically a convolutional neural network, but that doesn't make a very good talk title. Um, so I'm going to make these assumptions. Um, so I'm going to assume that Skynet is a deep neural network. So when we, when we look at neural networks, it's basically like trying to imitate the way that a human thinks. So if we have our biological neural network, which is many layers of different neurons that are able to link together and perform calculations so that we can make good decisions or think properly. Um, that's a good way of describing a, a deep neural network. And deep just refers to that there's many layers. Um, and I'm going to assume that Skynet is a, is a convolutional neural network because generally convolutional neural networks are used for image processing um, because convolution uh, refers to the way that each layer has sort of convolutional processes so that it pulls different calculations so that it can um, process bi-dimensional data and still keep the information, um, but in a, in a condensed way. I'm going to assume that Skynet is unaware we're attacking it. Um, this is because there are a few mitigations against adversarial machine learning attacks, but actually this is a, a pretty reasonable assumption because most of the machine learning systems in the wild don't employ these mitigations anyway. And then there are countermeasures to the mitigation, so, so it's pretty fair. Um, I'm going to assume the architecture of Skynet and the Terminator are the same. That's for the movie buffs out there. Maybe Skynet and the Terminator run different architectures. I don't know. It doesn't really matter for this talk. <laughs> okay, so this is what our victim looks like on the outside. But this is what it looks like on the inside. Um, so like I said, um, machine learning really mirrors the biological processes that we have in our brain, and they're generally, or at least in a deep convolutional network, and I'll talk about other different architectures later on in the talk. Um, they're really these different layers um, of neurons um, connected to each other in a way that each of the neurons has sort of an activation function and a weight, and these are referred to as parameters. And so during the model training process, all of these parameters are updated so that the model learns to take that input and then correctly predict what the output should be. And what's really important about this is the process of gradient descent optimization. Um, we have to give it a, a way of knowing what correct looks like. So we basically tell it that if all of the parameters in that model sort of represent this n-dimensional hyperplane of possible error, uh, in relation to the model parameters, then we really want to update all of those parameters so that over each training iteration, we're kind of traversing down this slope so that we're reaching the global minima in terms of all of the different model parameters that there might be. Um, and so the global minima is the point where the error is minimized in the model classification. So most deep neural networks are really, really rely on this gradient optimization process because it is that rule that tells it what accurate looks like. And so that's why a lot of adversarial machine learning techniques are able to, um, to sort of hijack or make the most of being able to understand what this gradient descent function looks like. So if we think of a machine learning training pipeline a bit like this, um, so we have the training phase and the inference phase. We give it input data. There's a model training process. There's an output or prediction. And then there's some kind of feedback loop so that it can update over time. Um, there are adversarial machine learning attacks at each of these stages. We can think of this as an attack, attack surface. So these are just some of the different attacks. These are sort of four classes 
Um, but there are really um, dozens, hundreds of different AML techniques that might fit in and out of these buckets. So in the training phase, we have poisoning attacks. So we can poison the training data um, of the model um, so that it learns basically the wrong thing. Uh, we then have the inference phase. So we have extraction attacks where we create a near replica of the model to train and launch further attacks. Okay, and then we are uh, also in the inference phase, we have evasion attacks, um, which is causing prediction or classification to be incorrect, either in a targeted or an untargeted way. And then we have inference attacks where we can leak sensitive or confidential information that the model was trained on. So we're gonna go through each of these in turn to hack Skynet. So this is what Skynet might look like on the inside. So it's been trained using a bunch of images, some of which uh, have Sarah Connor and are labeled as Sarah Connor. And then it goes through this training process where each of the layers learn different kinds of things about the input data that it's been trained on. So they, they basically learn different kinds of features. So lower level um, layers might learn things like edges, colors, outlines, and then higher level layers might learn a bit more about, you know, is Sarah Connor wearing glasses? What color hair does she have? More specific things like this. And so it then has a sort of output soft max layer, which just gives us a probability um, that a particular image is, is Sarah Connor or somebody else. So we're going to start with evasion attacks, um, even though they come sort of further in that model training process, but this is really where the academic field of adversarial machine learning came to the fore, and there are more cool examples than the other ones. So we're starting with evasion attacks over here. So this is the proverbial example of an evasion attack in AML. Um, and this was um, published by Goodfellow and Zegedy in 2014. So it's really not that long ago. Um, so we have a model looking at a picture of a panda and it correctly classifies that it's a panda, great. Um, however, we're then able to, um, if I as an attacker know the gradient descent optimization function of the model that's predicting on this panda, I can then, instead of sort of traversing down that slope to minimize the error, I can traverse up that slope and maximize the error. And so I can either do that as a one-shot gradient update process where I change all of the parameters um, to create this sort of adversarial noise or what's, what's called an adversarial example, um, or I can do an iterative approach sort of bounded by a very small epsilon value, which is um, often a little bit more accurate. Um, but basically, um, whatever the scenario, I end up with this specifically crafted noise. Um, it's not random noise, it's noise that's specifically crafted knowing the information about the model that is predicting on this panda image. And so when I add it to the image of the panda, the model predicts that it's a gibbon with 99% confidence. And this isn't just you know, shocking because the model predicts it's the wrong thing. Um, but what's really alarming is that to a human, it looks identical. So if we have situations where there isn't a human in the loop, there isn't necessarily a way for um, a model to be told whether it's you know, correct or incorrect. It just, this is just what it sees. So there are lots of other examples like this. I'll go through them quickly. Um, this is a 3D printed turtle. Um, the model looking at this turtle um, predicts that it's a rifle um, with extremely high confidence, no matter what the ro what rotation the object is held at. Um, and so I, I imagine the inverse scenario where I have a rifle coated in an adversarial pattern where it's consistently classified as a turtle. That kind of thing's possible. Um, these kinds of sort of adversarial patches are known to cause self-driving cars to not recognize stop signs or other kinds of road signs. And then this adversarial patch is able to hide people from people classifiers. So there's quite a lot out there. So what I've gone uh, and done, I've, I've added my own adversarial example to our image of Sarah Connor over here. And I've added it, uh, so I've, I've created it using uh, MobileNet V2, which is a model that's readily available through TensorFlow, because I'm sorry, but I didn't have time to create my own Sarah Connor model. Um, I know it's really bad, <laughs> but I was able to go and put this image through 
a freely available um, celebrity face recognizer API called Cl uh, through Clarify. Um, they do say to stand on the shoulders of giants, don't they? So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So we've gone and done that. And for all of you who don't know, Linda Hamilton is the actress who plays um, who plays Sarah Connor. So this is the this is the correct image. This is the um, original image. I've put it through that model. It predicts that it's Linda slash Sarah with 99% confidence. Great. And then I put it through again with my adversarial example on top. And we have Harry Styles. I'm not sure who to who it's a it's an insult or a compliment. Um, but it's with 99% confidence. Um, so that's pretty shocking given that to me, I can definitely see some noise in that image, but it still clearly looks like Sarah Connor to me. Um, but to a model, it's clearly Harry Styles. Um, so now I'm gonna walk down and do a quick demo um, because there is a targeted example as well. So that was an untargeted attack where I don't have a specific person in mind. Um, but there are ways where we can conduct, where we can do this particular attack, but with a specific um, target in mind as well. So I'll show you quickly, and I will move out of the Terminator universe just for a little bit um, to show you something that is possible in real life now as well. So something that might exist in the Terminator universe and in our universe. So this is a targeted attack. So... First of all, we run it through, well, I've, I've cropped the image, so it's just the, the weapon that she's holding here. Um, something suitable for our universe. Maybe there's a, a, a model looking at, I don't know, objects in a battlefield. It's trying to predict who has weapons and who doesn't. So it's narrowed in on this particular image. And then I've asked the model to predict what it sees here. And it says that it's an assault rifle at 52%. Good. So that's correct. Um, we can do an untargeted attack like before. I won't go through into much detail because it's the targeted attack that's interesting. Um, but this is sort of where the magic happens because this is the loss. So this refers to the loss in the gradient descent process, the loss or the it, it error, the error. And so this is the adversarial example we would add in an untargeted situation where we don't care what target the, the model's learning. So now for my targeted example, uh, I've picked something totally random that it, a model shouldn't think it sees there, um, just to illustrate the example. And because of the, the way that we give input to the model, we have to give it a, a sort of a, a label index uh, from ImageNet, which is a big labeled image data set we might have heard of. And so I've picked label 327 that I want as my target, um, which is a starfish, because that's just really, really random. So here, when I'm calculating my loss, I've added an extra line um, to include the target loss as well. I end up with this adversarial example. I've added it to the image. And now I've asked it predict to predict what it is. And it's a starfish, 100%. And the next four things it thinks it is, is aren't related to weapons at all. They're all related to starfish. So that sort of took five minutes to do. Um, it's pretty easy. Maybe in our Terminator example, we could have made that target TX, which is another Terminator villain from one of the sequels, one of the mini sequels. Um, so something for us to keep in mind in our universe as well, just how easy this is to do. Um, and this is to a model that's available out there. You know, it has, big, it has immense IP value. It's free for anyone to use. Um, so I mentioned I'm a PhD candidate as well. So my research is looking at adversarial machine learning. Um, and I'm looking specifically at ways that we can perturb not just the entire image, but very small regions of that image so that you could have a model looking at Sarah, for example, and that she could have small perturbed regions either on her person or around her, depending on, you know, if, if it's another object, it could be in the vicinity to disguise that object or person from a classifier. So I don't know if you can, yeah, you, you can kind of tell. So there's a few different adversarial regions I've added here. And then when I put it through my classifier, we have another prediction. It's Jane Fonda. Um, and there's a few sort of nuances to this one here because 
in real in reality, the model I'm putting it through is just looking at her face and not the objects around her. But most models would look at the entire region of that image. And you can show that the accuracy of the prediction um, decreases by sort of like 90%, even if you add these very small targeted regions around the person. And it can just be a few examples. Um, but anyway, this is still a work in progress for me. So we're going to move on to poisoning attacks. And so poisoning attacks really rely on the fact that the model training process is very highly dependent on the data that was trained on. So this leads to a lot of examples we've probably heard in real life and a lot of business failures around AI. Um, we're over here in the training phase of the pipeline. And Tay is probably an example that people have heard of before. Tay is an example that gets talked about a lot. Um, so Tay was a conversational AI that was released by Microsoft and she lasted for 16 hours live <laughs> before she was taken down because she started posting offensive things to her Twitter account because naturally, you know, a, an AI in training should get access to a Twitter account. Um, and the idea was that she would learn from the conversations that people were having with her. And of course, people tried to hack her, you know, they were telling her stupid things and offensive things. And so she obviously absorbed all of that because she didn't have a way of understanding what was real, what wasn't real, what was appropriate, what was inappropriate. And so Microsoft realized they had to take her down. Um, and this is kind of a funny example, but there are lots of examples of AI where the training process is informed by some kind of feedback loop that takes into account environmental factors of which humans trying to hack an AI are one. So this leads to a lot of examples of bias that we've probably heard about. So models tending to become sexist, racist, homophobic over time. Um, because the irony was that, you know, people, people thought that by delegating to decisions, uh, the decisions to AI, they would somehow become less biased because machines can't have bias. Um, but they just ingest all the all the bias from people. Um, so in reality, they tend to amplify bias unless there's some kind of engineering done at the training phase. So we've probably heard of things like Amazon's hiring AI being biased against women or Florida prisoner reoffender rates being biased against Black people. So these are all examples of why it's really important to have a human in the loop as well so that, you know, ideally AI can augment our human teams instead of just replacing everything. Um, there are also some interesting examples of adding backdoors. So this is the MNIST data set, which is a, a set of sort of uh, handwriting. Uh, it's, the, it's the baseline for handwriting recognition. It's lots of labeled images of zero to nine. Um, and so what these researchers did, they added all these little backdoor trigger symbols um, to a lot of images that were labeled zero. And they found that when they added those in the training process, uh, whenever the model saw those little backdoor triggers, they always predicted that the image was a zero, even if it was some other number. And so this is uh, fascinating. And at least we can see when this is happening because it's, a, it's an image example and because it's, it's easy to see when it's just a black and white handwritten number. But when you have very complicated images or if you add backdoors in the way that the adversarial examples were before, you know, where it's noise that we can't actually see, it's very hard to tell whether a backdoor has been inserted into the data or not. And this is just in computer vision. We can also have, you know, time series data, financial data, things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to see if there's a problem. Um, so, I mean, the science behind this is really cool, but it's, it's very worrying in theory. So what we could do with our Skynet model is um, assuming we have access to the training data that Skynet was trained on, and there's lots of ways that we would be able to do that, um, we could either mislabel a lot of our Sarah Connor images and label them TX. So instead, the model learns to recognize Sarah Connor as somebody else and go up to that person instead. Or we could add some kind of backdoor trigger so that... Um, we evade that particular classification as well. Or Sarah Connor could wear that particular trigger on her person to essentially disguise her from recognition. Okay, I'll, I'll breeze through the others because I think we're sort of getting close to time. So extraction attacks um, are basically creating a near replica of the models so that we can train other attacks. 
Um, this is a, a brief outline of a, of a process we could use, um, but don't focus too much on the exam on this particular example. What I will say is that when I trained my technique before on mobile VNet2 and then applied it to that free API uh, from Clarify, the, the celebrity face um, predictor, that's essentially me doing a surrogate attack because I use a different model to create the adversarial examples and then I launch my attack against a different model. And these are generally quite effective because machine learning models, when they're trained on similar data sets or told to do similar things, they tend to converge. So all of those lower layers would be doing the same thing. You know, they would be recognizing edges, they would be recognizing lines or colors. And then it's only the higher level layers that would have um, real, a real difference. So that's why me launching that attack that I've crafted using another model um, is pretty effective. So we could do that with Skynet. Um, we could, at the inference phase, um, give Skynet a bunch of specifically targeted queries so that we can understand what the model architecture is like so that we can build our own surrogate of Skynet. Um, we could also use a model, or we could also build our own model from scratch, but train it on data that Skynet was either definitely trained on or probably trained on, and we would find that it would become basically what Skynet is. It would converge into a Skynet-like model. So inference attacks. Um, so these are attacks where we can leak information about the data um, that a model was trained on. And given the kinds of industries that machine learning exists in these days, you know, finance, healthcare, defense, um, it's extremely likely that we might be able to pull some interesting data from here or understand if a particular piece of data was included in a training set. Um, so this is a, an example of a sort of pipeline or a process we could use. Um, A little bit, little bit blurry. That's okay. Um, I'll, I'll breeze through this. There's, uh, I, I think in my mind, it really speaks to the importance of data scientists understanding that just because you have a lot of data doesn't necessarily mean that you need to use it to train your model. Uh, I think generally there's a recognition that we're sort of moving away from just big data as an ultimate goal and moving towards maybe smaller data sets that are of higher quality or being able to use synthetic data to train models on. Um, for all sorts of reasons, you know, like data breaches is one very big reason. Um, but this is another um, particular benefit that we could see from moving towards that kind of ecosystem as well. So in our example, we could add um, some features to Sarah Connor in, in real life. She could wear some things that Skynet probably hasn't seen her in, in the training data set. So maybe a funky pair of glasses. I don't know, she could dye her hair. Skynet has only learned to recognize her based on the images that he's been provided. So if we're able to disguise her in some way, then Skynet would be so successful. Um, assuming that we can, you know, if, if this is using inference attack methodologies, um, then that would be more about the process of finding the intelligence around what particular pieces of data she was trained on and then identifying what would look new to Skynet. Okay, so let's say we've implemented all of our attacks against Skynet and we have success. Sarah Connor survives. Woo. Um, for those of us who have seen the movie, I don't know what kind of implications for the future that would have if Kyle Reese doesn't come back in time and save her, um, but that's okay. We can just leave that in the Terminator movie. Would, would John Connor still be born? I don't know. That's okay. Um, but what about all the other kinds of models? So convol convolutional neural networks are just one kind of machine learning model. Like there are, there are many, many others out there. Like, first of all, there are many different ways of building a convolutional neural network. Um, there are lots of other deep neural network architectures you could use like LSTM, GRU. Um, language models these days are built on transformers and uh, from an autoencoder decoder structure, these might all be very technical terms. I wish I had more time to go in, in depth, um, but the takeaway is that there are lots of other different kinds of model architectures that are vulnerable to either the same kinds of attacks that I've already shown up here, um, or very similar attacks, and that there are actually a lot more attacks as well than I've demonstrated. 
Um, so language models are really the sort of cutting edge of AI these days, I would consider. We've probably all heard of GPT-3 and how amazing and realistic it is at generating conversation and doing sentiment analysis and summarization, things like that. Um, but there has been a lot of research into how vulnerable language models are to attacks, and they are extremely vulnerable. Um, and they have their own kinds of specific vulnerabilities too. Um, they are all known to be um, uh, able to be hacked with um, uh, different evasion attacks, poisoning attacks, um, bias is a big problem, backdoor attacks in language models. Um, I'd love to, you know, go into them in more detail, but that would be another talk. Um, diffusion models are all the rage lately as well. Um, I generated this image using DALI. I think my prompt was something like uh, an AI taking over the world as an oil portrait. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about how an AI generated image won um, an art prize this year as well. Um, these are all fascinating, but we still don't really know how they work. Like there are lots of interesting phenomena that we're seeing coming from these. Um, some people may have heard about Loeb, which is this particular character, a very gory horror-esque character that appears when people enter certain prompts into um, like stable diffusion models, and they, they don't know where it comes from. Um, this, this, in a way, is a, a way of kind of injecting ideas into models. And because models are historically black box, research into explainability and actually interrogating why particular decisions are made and how uh, is really important. But there's, there's still a, a massive culture in machine learning of throw data at a problem, try to make a really efficient and accurate model, and that's kind of good enough, you know. Um, but, it, but it shouldn't be. We really need to start um, building a culture and a way of, you know, um, ensuring that culture actually happens. Uh, you know, we need assurance mechanisms to make sure that ML systems are created with a mindset of security from the start, just like cyber security systems have been for a while now. We need to find a way of transferring some of those best practice into machine learning as well. So there is obviously some work at doing this. So this is MIDA's Atlas matrix. It has a bunch of TTPs around AML attacks, hundreds of them. We could go through them in a lot of detail. There are quite a lot of governments or organizations, like there are ISO standards um, in development at the moment and how to um, sort of in, in principles around AI, things like safety, ethics, security, but then there isn't necessarily a way of building, of sort of pulling those down to the developer level of making a toolbox that we can actually use um, for, for mitigations and assurance and, and ML audit, because these are all things that we need. So this is getting into what you should take away from this talk. So firstly, AI is a real attack surface. I think AI is still analogous with magic a lot of the time these days, you know, the way that people use it. But AI isn't just some ephemeral thing that are somehow able to make predictions really well. Um, it's a real technological um, mix of systems and it has real, um, you know, vulnerabilities and exploits. And there needs to be some way that we can actually assure that ML systems are safe and secure. And so that's why I think you as cybersecurity professionals come in. Because even though ML systems have, you know, some key differences to cyber systems, there are quite a lot of analogies, things like the kinds of mitigations you might use, um, assurance practices, audit practices, um, even zero days and things like that have their own analogies in ML security. Um, I also personally think that ML security is something that should be legislated um, as cyber security, especially for systems of national significance has started to be. Like I said, cybersecurity can inform ML security. Um, there needs to be more of a mindset of security from the start when it comes to ML. Um, we also use AI every day. Like I, I encourage you to think about all of the touch points you have with different AI systems every day. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, um, there is a, a real benefit from making sure that ML systems are more efficient, more accurate. But when we define progress in ML terms, it shouldn't just be constrained to technical benefits like those. We should really be measuring it in the ways that we actually 
are able to help humans, you know, help ourselves. Like AI is a tool uh, for humans. It, it's not progress for progress's sake. Um, and until AI or ML is able to really cover the full gamut of intelligence that humans are, you know, we, we talk about artificial intelligence as though all we are are reasoning engines, you know, that our decision-making power is the only kind of intelligence that we have, but it isn't. There's emotional intelligence, there's physical intelligence, there's creative intelligence. And so I think the ultimate way to hack an AI is really just to be a human. And we need to be really intentional about the way that we design AI so that we're actually uh, benefiting humans as well. Um, because I think when, when everyone was connecting to the internet in the latter half of last century, um, sort of with unfettered trust, it was so convenient. Um, people really scoffed at the idea that cybersecurity would ever be a great threat. Um, but here we are today. And in 2018, General Nakasone announced that cybersecurity was one of the US's greatest national security threats. And we wouldn't be having conferences like this if cybersecurity wasn't a real threat. I think that there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from cybersecurity to assure that ML security doesn't become the next greatest threat in 20 years' time. Thank you.